Okay, um, so I asked this earlier, but ha how many of you have been to a Chautauqua or the Chautauqua? How many of you have been to Bayview? Well, Bayview is a Chautauqua. Um, there are many Chautauquas around the country. Uh, not many of them still function. Bayview is one of those, uh, the dozen or so that survives. The closest one to where we live is Lakeside, which is down in northern Ohio near Sandusky. You've been to Lakeside? That's a Chautauqua. Um, both the original Chautauqua, Bay, Bayview, and Lakeside are almost 150 years old now. Uh, this is the 150th anniversary of Chautauqua coming up this summer. Um, and Bayview and Lakeside both went down the Chautauqua path pretty early. Uh, they didn't start a Chautauqua, so we'll talk about that. All right. So uh, what we're going to do is talk about this movement that uh, really we're focusing on the period from 1874 to about 1930, when the, the Chautauqua as a movement pretty much disappeared. Um, it still exists. There are still Chautauquas around, about a dozen that I would call real Chautauquas. And then you have kind of um, Chautauqua wannabes, I guess. Uh, and they, they, there are a lot of those around, but of the original Chautauquas, there's about a dozen still around. Uh, maybe half of them function in a way that I would call them truly functioning Chautauquas. The others are not necessarily really going down the path of what the Chautauqua was originally. Um, so why are we bothering with Chautauqua? Why do I bother talking about this? Well, th there's several main things here. Chautauqua pays a pivotal role in the evolution of higher education in America. Um, it, th th it was largely a, a, a women's led movement, not led movement, but, but women participation. Probably, depending on how you want to cut this, 60-65% of the participants, the active participants in the various Chautauqua arms were women. Um, it is, in my view, one of the important uh, platforms for the progressive movement, which was probably the most important reform movement in American history uh, that's kind of around the turn of the century era. And it is, uh, I think, the break point for liberal Protestantism. Down one path, you, you come down a path of essentially fundamental Christians and that path splits around say 1910 and the fundamentalists continue more or less down the path they have been on and liberal Protestants are going down a different path and that path runs straight through Chautauqua. So we'll talk about all this stuff as we go on. Uh, I'm a historian, so we have to put stuff in the proper context, so bear with me here for a few minutes while I ramble. Uh, there's two main things that we have to kind of start with. The first is the Second Great Awakening, which is the great religious revival that swept through the United States in the first half of the 19th century. It creates the Protestant America you think of today, which is very different than the Protestant America that existed in colonial days. The Second Great Awakening kind of some major things that happen here are first of all evangelical Protestants start to not completely but largely reject the idea of predestination. Uh, the Protestantism of colonial era is essentially Calvinist. The dominant denominations would be the Presbyterians and the uh, Congregationalists who were the Puritan church. The Presbyterians essentially split over this issue. The Congregationalists more or less step away from the idea of predestination. And most of the other denominations of the Second Great Awakening kind of step away from the idea of predestination. Most importantly, the Methodists and the Baptists. But uh, there are a number of denominations that get started in the Second Great Awakening. Um, the Methodists and the Baptists, who are very small in 1800, are the two largest denominations by 1850. Um, Another important thing about the Second Great Awakening is um, the idea of the end of times. If you're a Christian, you believe there's a second, great, second coming of Christ. There will be a last judgment and essentially an end of times. And somewhere in there, probably a millennium of a thousand years of peace and harmony. Generally, Christians up until this point would have been pre-millennialists. 
which means that they believe Christ will come. It will be a second coming of Christ. He will usher in the millennium, the thousand years of peace and harmony. That will conclude with the, the last judgment and the end of times and all that. In this era, post-millennialism became uh, increasingly important. Uh, now, you never say everybody believed anything, right? That's just not what's smart to do as a historian. But, but post-millennialism became a principal factor of the Second Great Awakening. And that's really important because the idea of post-millennialism is that the millennium comes first, then the second coming of Christ, then the last judgment. Now, why is that so important? Well, Premillennialists would believe that Christ brings the millennium. Postmillennialists would say Christ comes after the millennium. So who brings the millennium? You do. It's a result of human agency. And what this does is in this era, uh, among these evangelical Protestants of the Second Great Awakening, there is a great movement to perfect society, reform society, as a way to usher in the millennium. And so what that does is it leads to the first great reform movement in American history in the 1830s and 40s. Things like the temperance movement, women's rights, prison reform, uh, education, uh, healthy eating. Think John Kellogg and, you know, Kellogg's of Battle Creek. That's post-millennial stuff. And especially the anti-slavery movement. Eventually, the anti-slavery movement pretty much subsumes all of these other reform movements in the 1850s, and it's a race to the Civil War. The Civil War is a creation of post-millennialists to a very large extent. Not exclusively. You don't have to be a post-millennialist to think slavery is wrong. But numerically, uh, I think the volume of Northerners that come up with anti-slavery positions are, are going to be these post-millennialists. In any event, um, this millennial idea of millennial reform is, is very important. The other thing that's kind of sitting here is that Americans of this area very much believe that the United States was God's chosen land. Uh, frankly, all you had to do was look out the front door in 1810, and if this isn't Eden, it's pretty close to it. Um, and it's the idea that um, America is God's chosen land, and God retrusted, and all of that stuff comes out of this era. Um, and that this cycle of the end of times is going to begin here first, and it's going to happen relatively soon. Now, nobody, most people didn't say when it was going to happen. They didn't say next year or the year after that, although that's not completely true because some people did think it was going to happen on October 23rd, 1844. It didn't, but <laughs> nonetheless, they thought it was going to. Um, and the it's just the idea that America is this special place in God's plan and this millennium cycle or that sorry this end of time cycle is going to begin here relatively soon okay the Mormons the church of latter day saints we are in the latter days before the cycle begins in whatever form you thought it was going to happen the second big thing here that's kind of hanging underneath all of this is the industrial revolution which by the time you get into around 1850 is well underway in the United States. The big kick to it comes in the Civil War. And by the time you get past the Civil War, the United States is well on its way to, the, to, to becoming the leading industrial power in the world. And the three great things that happened in the last half of the 19th century are the, urbanization, or sorry, the industrialization of America, the urbanization of America, and the coming of non-evangelical sorry, non-Anglo-Saxons, non-Protestants to America from Eastern, Southern, and Central Europe, uh, which all three of those forces create a very different world in the United States than it had been around prior to, say, the Civil War or 1850. It's just a hugely different country in 19, 1890 than it was in 1850 for all of those reasons. Um, and then, of course, in the midst of this comes the Civil War, which is a shed water mark in all of American history. I don't make a big deal out of this because, frankly, I'm not sure I could prove it exactly. But I think there's a certain percentage of these evangelical Protestants of the Second Great Awakening looked at the Civil War, at least at the outset, as the chance to kind of begin the cycle. If we can get rid of slavery, that great sin in American society, will the millennium not begin? 
I don't know how widespread that was, that belief, but it certainly existed. The fact is, of course, it didn't happen. And the Civil War certainly was, to some extent, kind of a colossal failure from the perspective of these millennialists. Um, now, there's two other factors here that I want to throw out here about the Industrial Revolution and where that fits into this story. The first is the Industrial Revolution is very much driven by increased scientific advancement on the part of Western society. Um, the evangelical Protestants of the Second Great Awakening uh, would have basically said that the world is explained in the Bible. By the time you get into the post-Civil War era, increasingly the world is being explained by science, not the Bible. And in particular, Charles Darwin and his theories of evolution that is published in The Origin of Species in 1859. Um, then this is a terrible shock, of course, for the people of these evangelical Protestants who have put th their, their hopes in the Bible, that now we've got this alternate explanation. Okay? A prior explanation had been around since the dawn of time. Even before Christianity, religion explained the world. Now, science is explaining the world, and that's a bigger change than I think most of us realize. And of course, in particular, Darwin. The second thing is that the Industrial Revolution, for the first time in human history, created a surplus. I mean, it always had a 5% or maybe a 10% of the population that could live off the fat of the other 90 or 95%. And so you did have rich, you did have people with a certain amount of leisure time. But by and large, the Industrial Revolution brought a surplus of time and of disposable income that created leisure for the first time really in human history. Now, not leisure for everybody. Um, there had always been the leisure for the rich, and now what's happening in, in this phase is leisure for the middle classes, which is a big part of the American population. Um, the point is, it's the leisure that these middle classes started to have that they used to go to Chautauqua. And at Chautauqua, one of the things that's going on is they are coming to grips with all of these changes that I just mentioned here, primarily relative to the Industrial Revolution, urbanization, immigration, and the rise of science. And it's this old stock evangelical children and, and grandchildren of the Second Great Awakening, they're the ones that create and go to Chautauqua in the post-Civil War era. And there, Chautauqua becomes an important platform for this reform movement, the second great reform movement in American history known as the Progressive Era. So that's a lot, but it's what we do. <laughs> All right, so now we get into the, to the next kind of issue here. By the way, is this enough or do you want me to turn off the lights? Are you okay with this? All right, then we'll just leave it as it is. So the question is, what's a Chautauqua? Well, Chautauqua is a lot of things. First of all, it's a place. There is Lake Chautauqua in western New York, and the place we're talking about where all of this got started was originally called Fairpoint, but by the time you get to 1878, 1879, its official name is Chautauqua. There is a village of Chautauqua. There is a Chautauqua institution, and both of those things are on Lake Chautauqua in western New York. To some people, a Chautauqua is a resort for religious people, these evangelical Protestants that we're talking about. They go to the lake for a resort or for a recreation, and that's fair. I mean, that's true. It's a summer school. It's where you go to take classes in the summer. That also is true. It's a place for resort, a leisure place, uh, and that's certainly true. This is all coming about at the time we start going to watch baseball games as spectators, amusement parks, bathing beaches, uh, you know, destination hotels. Uh, all of that stuff starts in America in this post-Civil War era, and Chautauqua sits right in the middle of all of that. One of the unfortunate things <laughs> is that historians generally have taken Chautauqua and trivialized it as simply one of these areas of recreation. Okay? And you can make the case it is a place of recreation. There's no doubt about it. But there's more. Um, 
I love this quote from, from James Garfield. It has been the struggle of the world to get more leisure. It finally comes with the Industrial Revolution, at least for the middle classes. But it was left for Chautauqua to show us how to use it. And what the Chautauquans basically did is they used that leisure time to improve themselves, their families, their role in society, their relationship with God. All of that, we're going to make our lives better at Chautauqua. It's not a question of going on the roller coaster or going to the beach or playing golf or going to watch the, uh, you know, the New York Knickerbockers play baseball. We're going to use that leisure time for something productive. Today, the remaining Chautauquas are kind of together in a little organization called the Chautauqua Trail. And they talk about the four pillars of Chautauqua. And I think that's pretty good. Religion, first. Okay, I think you have to recognize that Chautauqua started as a religious, organ, a religious orientation. Second is education. Education, to me, is what makes Chautauqua Chautauqua. The arts and recreation. Now, to me, there should only be three pillars. I would say the arts is really either you're learning how to play or to draw or whatever, or you are performing. So it either falls under the education pillar or under the recreation pillar, but the current Chautauquans talk about the four pillars. They never ask my opinion. There's so many people that never ask my opinion. I just don't understand. <laughs> but um, in any event, the four pillars, it works. Um, and this is from John Vincent, who was one of the co-founders of Chautauqua. It, i.e. Chautauqua, aims to take people on all sides of their natures and cultivate them symmetrically, making men, women, and children everywhere more affectionate and sympathetic as members of a family. This is very much a family-oriented thing. More conscientious and reverent as worshipers together of the true God. More intelligent and thoughtful as students of a universe in a universe of ideas a more industrious, economical, just, and generous as members of society in a workaday world. That's Chautauqua. Okay, that's Chautauqua. Um, Chautauqua is a movement, and I, I kind of was really talking about this. To me, Chautauqua, what makes Chautauqua important is it is where this class of people, these largely Anglo-Saxon, evangelical Protestants, old stock Americans, heavily middle class oriented, although not exclusively, essentially come to grips with the world that is being created as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution in the post-Civil War America. And it's a movement to do, address those issues. And it is this place, as I, I kind of mentioned a little earlier, it's where Protestantism di divides. When this thing all starts, everybody is essentially a fundamentalist. Okay? The Bible is the word. It is the truth. It's, everything is in the Bible. By the time you get to 1900, 1910, this accommodation with science that you find at Chautauqua has started to create this split where, the, again, the fundamentalists essentially are continuing down the line they've already been on. The split is really liberal Protestants who essentially attempt to accommodate science. We can't deny science. So somehow we have to accommodate it. And those are the folks that I think move down the path of liberal Protestantism. And it's the split in Protestant America that I think is a very fundamental uh, to how Protestantism evolved in this country. There are, I would say, four Chautauquas. The first Chautauqua is that place on Lake Chautauqua. It is what we're going to talk about most because it is the most complete version of Chautauqua. And the other Chautauquas are significant or superficial emulations of the mother Chautauqua. Okay. The second Chautauqua is the at-home Chautauqua. These books up here are books of the CLSC, the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle. We'll talk much more about this later on. But essentially, this is a correspondence course, reading club. It's something that was done at home and in small groups, circles, in thousands of towns all around the country. And tens of thousands of participants. Then you have the independent Chautauquas. Fairly early on, 
other organizations began to try to emulate the Mother Chautauqua in New York. There may have been up to 500 of those. I don't think any more than 100 or so would be, I would consider, significant Chautauquas. Some of them lasted till today, and some of them, like Lake Orion, lasted 10 years, 12 years, um, 11 years, 12 years, I don't know, 12 years. Um, so the independent Chautauquas. Bayview is an independent. I referred to Lakeside. That's an independent Chautauqua. And then you have the Circuit Chautauquas. Um, around 1908, uh, a, an enterprising um, uh, organizer, businessman, who was a, a manager of the Red Path Lyceum Bureau, created a Chautauqua, bought tickets, bought some tents, and took it on the road, much like a circus that would go on the road, except that instead of having lions and tigers and bears, oh my, you had a Chautauqua that would travel around the country. The Circuit Chautauqua version of Chautauqua is the version that most people would have seen. At its peak, I've seen some estimates that 40 million people attended Chautauquas, traveling Chautauquas, in the summer of 1924. That was the 50th anniversary. That was the big year. I, I can't get there. The numbers are just too big. But let's say 20 million Americans, in, when the population was about 120 million. So it, it's huge. Okay. They are pale imitations of the Mother Chautauqua, but nonetheless, at least in, from their best, they were good attempts within the confines of the traveling Chautauqua. Now, what is a Chautauqua? If we were going to build a Chautauqua today, ah, gosh, wait, the first thing you have to do is go buy some land on a nice bucolic setting. So we're going to get three or 400 acres on Higgins Lake. We're going to build some cottages and lease them out. Or we're going to lease out land and people can build their own little cottages. Uh, we're going to have a great hotel with a big uh, porch on the front overlooking Higgins Lake. There's going to be a nice uh, restaurant in there. Not fancy restaurant, but a big restaurant where lots of people can eat. There'll be reading rooms inside there. We're going to have some, some educational buildings. We'll have docks and tennis courts and all kinds of recreational places. We're going to have a huge auditorium that'll seat three, four, five. The biggest auditorium sat about 15,000 people. Uh, but two, three, four thousand would be fairly typical for Chautauqua to have. Uh, Lakeside, or Lake Orion's was about 2,000 people that it, they built. Um, we're going to uh, hire Albion College to come in and run a summer school. They're going to have some of their courses that will be for credit that might run for six weeks, whereas others might last for a week or two weeks or three weeks, shorter classes for the U and I that might want to take a class on, I don't know, Chautauquas or something. Um, we're going to get George Perot III to come in and do the, uh, the, the American Adventure series on Thursday afternoons. We'll get Face the Nation to come in and do a Wednesday morning version and all of this stuff. And of course, there's going to be a guest minister that will show up every Monday and they'll be there all week and they'll, be, they'll, they'll do uh, a prayer service in the morning. They'll do a, a lecture on essentially how Christians should behave in the modern world or Jewish. If in today's world you have Jewish and Catholic, but then they would have all been Protestant. Uh, uh, we'll have YMCA come in and do a children's camp and some fitness programs, all kinds of different things going on. Um, this is what a day at Chautauqua might look like if you went. You get up in the morning, you go down to the beach for a quick swim. And then on the way back to the cottage, you stop at the uh, morning prayer service, uh, the, the amphitheater overlooking the lake. And then you go back and get the kids and the spouse and you go to breakfast in the dining hall. And then afterwards, you go to your book club discussion. The Awakening of a Nation, Mexico Today. That was one of the discussion topics in 1910 or something like that. Um, and then after that one, you're going to go to a lecture by Jacob Rees the guy who took all those pictures of slums in New York City in 1900 and 1890. That's it. He would come to Chautauqua a lot to do his lantern shows. And then you're going to go to lunch and you're going to meet the family. And after that, you're going to go back to the cottage and probably take a nap or sit on the porch and read a book because uh, then at uh, 2 o'clock, you've got to go off to your drawing lessons and you spend a couple hours there in your drawing classes. And then afterwards, you're going to go meet the family for shuffleboard, go to dinner. After dinner, maybe you go down to the, to the amphitheater again and, and for vespers. And then you go off to the auditorium, because there's always going to be entertainment at night at the auditorium. 
and tonight it happens to be the Hungarian Concert Orchestra. Again, a real thing, real it guys. Like a busy day. They're beautiful. I love these things, <laughs> right? Um, I can't say I've ever spent a whole summer at Chautauqua and done this day after day for nine weeks, but I've spent, you know, a week at a time doing this. It is absolutely glorious, okay? Uh, now, of course, I didn't necessarily fill up every day, but you could do it like this. You actually could. Um, now, again, where did all of this come from? Well, as I mentioned before, it's this response of the evangelical Protestants, the children and grandchildren of the Second Great Awakening, to a changing America. Um, and a couple of things are going on in this era that start to come together. The camp meeting movement, evangelical Protestants in the Second Great Awakening were great goers to camp meetings. Because if you lived in Lake Orion in 1830, there was no church. In fact, there were no ministers. So where did you get any kind of religious instruction? In the woods, a camp meeting that might be held for a week underneath the trees. And you'd show up with your tent, and in the mornings you'd cook up your breakfast and maybe make some sandwiches. And then about 11 o'clock or noon, the ministers would start going. And they'd go all day, all night. Uh, sermonizing and lecturing and it would be this highly emotionally charged event. The Second Great Awakening is built on those camp meetings. By the time you get to the Civil War, that type of camp meeting had been, things had calmed down. Um, churches, ministers, there were enough basically and the camp meetings were kind of hearkening back to the good old days. Um, and in the post-Civil War era, uh, you have a revival of these camp meetings, but they're not the same kind of emotional sort of thing. They really more are more laid back, though more recreation oriented. Again, bucolic settings, families would go, but it was all about Bible study and, and preaching and that sort of thing. Uh, that was the heart and soul of it. And then you had the Sunday School movement. Again, it predates the Civil War a bit. Uh, but really in the post-Civil War era, the Sunday School movement really kicks off. And the idea here is a couple of things. First of all, make teachers better. Secondly, not, not only better from their knowledge of the Bible, but also knowledge of how to teach. Okay. Pedagogy becomes a very important thing of, of, of what's going on here with these Sunday School teachers. How to organize Sunday Schools and then how to have consistent programs across all of these evangelical Protestant denominations. So basically the Methodists are their Sunday schools look very similar to what the Presbyterians are doing, which would look very similar to what the Disciples of Christ are doing, which would look very similar to what the Christians were doing. And all of these would have similar, the same kind of program. That was the desire, anyhow. Never quite got there, but that was the intent. And then uh, there's this issue of the lack of higher education in America. And we'll get to that in a minute. From a narrow perspective, it's these two guys. Lewis Miller the fellow on the right, and uh, John Hale Vincent, Reverend John Hale Vincent. Um, they're the ones that actually create the Lake Chautauqua Sunday School Assembly at the Fairpoint Campgrounds meeting on August 4 to August 18, 1874. That's where it starts. Miller, sorry, Vincent was a, a Methodist minister. He had become, been a circuit rider when he was a boy of 18 in central Pennsylvania in the mid-1840s, late 1840s. And by the time we get to this era, post-Civil War, 1860s, he is a big wheel in the Methodist Sunday School movement and in the Sunday School Union, which is a consolidation of all these evangelical Protestant denominations and their attempt to standardize Sunday schools. Well, Vincent is a big deal in that. He's living in Chicago at the time. Um, and, well, in fact, I think he winds up getting assigned to New York somewhere in the like 1867, 68, something like that. In any event, um, he had been involved in training Sunday school teachers for a long time. And at this stage of the game, he's kind of the big wheel in the Sunday school movement, one of the big wheels. And he is pushing to try to have a national conference of Sunday school teachers, a big conference that would be drawing people from all over the country. Now, as it turns out, Lewis Miller, who lived in Akron and born just outside of Canton, uh, 
and had become pretty wealthy as a manufacturer of the Buckeye hay rake. So go look up on Google the Buckeye hay rake, you can find it. And it, he, it basically is a safety thing. Instead of farmers getting chopped up by their hay rake, they lived, okay? And that's courtesy of Lewis Miller. Any of it, he makes, uh, he makes a good income. But he's also very interested in education. Neither of these guys ever went to college. Uh, both went to high school. Miller never finished. Uh, Vincent, I think, did finish high school, but he didn't really go any further than that other than some seminary classes that he would have taken. Um, but education was very important to these guys. Miller gets involved in the public schools in Akron on the, board of, uh, the, the, the school board. He is on the board of directors of Mount Union College for about 40 years. Mount Union College is located just east of Canton a little ways. And he gets very much involved in the Sunday school movement and comes up with some very creative things to make the Sunday schools work very well in uh, Akron. And it's in that way that Vincent and Miller become friends in the late 1860s, early 1870s. And Miller kind of, you know, they're chatting about this, this national Sunday school idea that M Vincent had. And Miller says, look, what we should do is hold this at Fairpoint. Fairpoint is a camp meeting site on the western shore of Lake, Superior, or Lake Chautauqua that had just started in 1872. And Miller says, well, why don't we go there and you could hold your Sunday school conference in this outdoor setting. Vincent doesn't want to do that because he doesn't like the idea of being associated with camp meetings because this whole emotionalism associated with camp meeting stuff, Vincent doesn't like. Nor does Miller, honestly. But eventually, Miller convinces Vincent that doing this outdoors, so you have this kind of recreational aspect to it, you know, out under, you know, in, in God's environment, in nature, um, would be a good thing. And Miller, uh, Vincent goes along with it. And because of Vincent's role in the Methodist Church, he just gets it going. And in 1874, August 4, 1874, the first Chautauqua Sunday School comes together. All right. Two weeks, next year it's three weeks, and then for the next couple of years it's three weeks, and then things start to explode in 1879, 1878. Um, so here's the thing. What happened at the Sunday School Institute at Fairpoint in 1874 is a function of this rising leisure. These Sunday School teachers have the leisure to take a couple of weeks off and go on vacation, but while they're there, improve their ability as a Sunday School teacher. And they're going to do this at camp meeting site, Fairpoint. But the purpose is to improve their skills as a Sunday school teacher. That's where this starts in 1874. Chautauquans are having the 150th anniversary of Chautauqua this year. But it isn't a Chautauqua yet. It's a Sunday school uh, training camp. That's what it is in 1874, 150 years ago. What happens in 1878 is that Miller and Vincent add a secular education component on top of it. And it's that when I think you can start to talk about Chautauqua being Chautauqua. Until then, it's a Sunday school training in institute. But from 1878 on, I think you can start to talk about this as Chautauqua. Now, how do you justify this? Um, well, first of all, and th th is that essentially all knowledge is God's knowledge. There is no separation between religious knowledge and secular knowledge. It's all God's knowledge. Um, the second thing is that there was a time when education was the province of the rich. You want to go to college, go to high school? You had to be wealthy. Miller and Vincent both were repelled by that idea. And they thought it was extremely important to allow everybody to have the kind of educa higher education that was necessary to advance in society. Um, so those are, I think, the two big things going on here. This gives you some statistics here, I think, that point to the problem. In 1870, there are seven and a half million <coughs> American children going to grammar school. That's just about everybody. Universal education in the United States in 1870 through primary school. But look at the numbers for secondary school and look at the numbers for college. It's this big. What's secondary? High school, okay. junior high school okay. and above. This is higher education. 
junior high school, high school, and college. You, get, you graduate from high school and you're going to be a teacher. 50% of them would, have go be, would go be a teacher right, after a high school education. Right. The, so the people going here are, the, are the, the wealthy, the prosperous, and the occasional workaholic who manages to figure out a way to, to pay for their education in this sort of an environment. Look what happens in 1930. Population triples, the number of people in primary edge school triples. In secondary education, the number increases 55 times. <laughs> it triples in primary school, increases 55 times in secondary school. In college, it increases 20 times. This is when Chautauqua begins, and this is when it ends. In my view, it ends because it doesn't serve a purpose anymore. Okay, now, this obviously isn't overnight, but the decline of Chautauqua is you know, a 15, 20 year phenomenon, but it comes to a screeching end with the depression in 1930. But the fact is, it's no longer needed as an educational institution. Yeah. What, if you, what do you say, because a lot of people talk about college not being um, needed anymore. Well, I don't think that's true. <laughs> well, I'm going to say for the mass populace. You know, uh, um, I mean, well, college, I, college in today's world is not a, necessarily a business the, uh, potentially the right business thing to do, potentially, if, if you can get into skilled trades and things of that nature. So I'm just, yeah. it seems like there's even a go to, you know, 2024 and say, okay, well, here's the scenario. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's going to be any great reversal of the number of people going to college or high school anytime soon. Uh, yeah, well, high school. Is it there? But, uh, you know, whether or not there should be more skilled trades being taught, that's an entirely different issue. Um, the other thing that's going on here is increasingly what happened as you get towards the 1860s is that the American population generally starts to talk about the value of recreation. That the workaday world has become, especially those that get caught up in this urban industrial world, that that world is so stressful that you needed to have this break. And so let's have a break. Okay, let's have recreation. Okay, let's have resort kinds of places. Uh, let's take a vacation. And Chautauqua fits into that. The other thing is purely business. Uh, there's only, and, and Vincent literally said this, there's only so long we're going to be able to keep this thing going if the funding is going to come exclusively from Sunday school teachers. We need to broaden this out. And the fact is that most of these Chautauquas, the independent Chautauquas, like Bayview and Lakeside, um, they expanded their offerings to fill up the buildings during the, when they weren't having a Sunday or when they weren't doing other things. They wanted to get more people in. Uh, so Chautauquas grew in part for business reasons. Now, the big thing that happened in 1878, in August of 1878, is Vincent gets up in front of the people at Chautauqua in New York and he announces the, uh, the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle. And what this is intended as is a, a place where people could go and participate in a structured reading and study program. You think about it as kind of a cross between a reading club and a correspondence class and a, um, I don't know, a women's club. And I say women's club without any embarrassment because 60, 70 percent of the people who participated in the CLSC were women. They would get together once a week, they would have readings, there would be discussion topics, they'd hold discussions, there would be not quite tests but something like that in order to advance and after four years you would get that certification that would indicate that you had completed this structured reading program. Think in terms of a four-year liberal arts degree. That's what's going on here. It's something like that. Now, Miller and Vincent would never have called this a four-year college degree. They, in fact, were emphatic that it was not. Nonetheless, it's not a bad comparison. Okay. Now, this was just a start. Um, Vincent and Miller looked at this as something that would be the first step towards a more a lifelong reading program. All these little stickers here. Those represent additional courses that they would have taken. 
This is the 1887 handbook for the Chautauqua, the additional courses. So there's the, um, let's see here. There's a physiology course and there's the wonders of the human body, physiology for practical use, mental, mental physiology, the foundation of death. Uh, there's Shakespeare, uh, read, well, let's see, that's a little complicated. The story of nations, the story of Chaldea, the story of Assyria, ancient Egypt, Persia, Carthage, Alexander's empire, the story of the Goths, the story of the Normans, and the story of the Moors, and the story of the Saracens. And if you do those readings and complete the coursework for it, then you get, you know, a scarlet shield, seal that's shaped like a shield. So it's probably up there on that right there. This one has about 70 of those things on here. There were in total about 80 of these courses. This was lifelong structured reading. And this book is filled with the 70 or 80 courses and the readings required for that. Okay. Um, the, th there was, yeah. So, just curious, um, I just said, uh, was it like pass-fail, or were there? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. They, they were if not. You, if, you, if you did the readings, and you were involved in the discussions, and you stuck it out, then that was considered that you completed No, you did, there was a written component to it. There was. That was the interesting thing, I haven't quite figured this out. Early on, uh, I, I see where this is happening, I, I, Vincent is basically, getting volunteer professors to read these papers. Uh, Vincent put this together in the, well, probably starting in 1876, he started working on it, uh, but certainly the winter of 1877, he spent a lot of time talking to the, the very best college professors in the country, the leading educational people in the country, trying to get their buy-in to this. And then initially they were, most of them were all behind it, and many of them took on roles as essentially mentors for these circles. Um, now as time went on, I'm not sure whether that was able to continue. Eventually, what the, the CLSC is today, and this starts to move this direction by around 1910, is it's much, it's, it's more or less like an Oprah's Reading Club. Well, Oprah's Reading Club is like the CLSC. Um, and I, they don't have quite the same educational element to it, and they certainly don't have the structured kind of uh, <coughs> testing that went behind it. Yeah. Who would lead these? The, in, in each of these towns, you would get together. That, I haven't found one, but there was probably a CLSC here in Lake Orion. Uh -huh. And the people in the town would, would get together. They would elect their, their president, their secretary, whatever. And you might have five people, you might have 40 people. Okay. It would depend. There so were thousands of, it, it was your own circle. Right? right, and about 60 to 65 percent of the participants were women. Uh, and there's a direct line here to the women's club movement. Mm -hmm. So you, you had books that you would you would you'd pay your your fee. The books would I think you had to buy the books separate. Um, they weren't very expensive, but a buck and a half was worth something back in you know 1880. And then every month you would get a copy of the Chautauquan Magazine. Now this is a six month compilation of the Chautauquan Magazine. It was bound sometime in the 1880s. These are the titles. The people who live in Algiers. The extermination of American animals. Uh, child labor and some of the results. Divorce in the United States. How can I become a distinct speaker? Uh, the French Constitution. The action of glaciers. Uh, the uh, life in medieval Italy, medieval Italy, Venice and Rome, um, the uses of mathematics, Karl Marx, uh, the nationalization of industry in Europe, and on it goes. And I'll tell you what, you're not going to find any pictures. <laughs> this is some dense reading. I would hate like hell to have to sit down and study this thing. It is thick stuff. Okay, They weren't kidding around. Okay, these are not graphic novels. Okay, they are real serious readings. Um, in any event, uh, that's the CLSC, and this is where the, the real educational component starts. One of the good things about the CLSC is that it's something you could take on the road. Every town could have it, and then the CLSC could provide the basis 
for any independent Chautauqua to start their own education program. There was a CLSC here at Lake Orion when, or at least there were meetings at the CLSC uh, at the um, Chautauqua that was held here at Chautauqua, or at uh, Lake Orion. Um, so, so did they start some sort of franchise? Did they, did they make money? No. Um, uh, it was not a money-making operation. Um, the, most of the books ultimately were written by Chautauqua itself. There was a guy who, who probably did, he had a good income, I'm pretty sure. He published the books and he published the Chautauqua magazine. Um, it, after a while, it didn't start that way initially. Initially the books were off the shelf kind of books, but the publishers couldn't keep up. And so Chautauqua started its own printing company to produce the books uh, that were necessary. Um, just to give you an idea of this, between 1882 and 1893, the CLSC graduated 27,141 women. All of the colleges in the country graduated 32,000 women. Right. By 1900, there had been 10,000 circles that had been created. Now, they didn't exist in 1900. These things came and went. But by 1900, there had been 10,000 circles. The numbers get a little fuzzy here because there was a fire and a lot of the records were lost in the mid-1890s. Um, so it's hard to kind of keep track of all of this. By 1914 there had been nearly 50,000 female graduates. There had been 275,000 that were enrolled. Now one of the things, not only it, did it happen because it's human nature, but it was encouraged. If you can't afford it, show up and borrow somebody else's book. You're not going to be able to graduate unless you've paid the fee because we're not going to grade your tests or whatever. They, they didn't call them tests. Um, but it was encouraged. So the enrolled, you have to probably double it at least, maybe triple it for the number, probably triple it for the number of people who participated. Um, so the, the numbers are big. And this is just women. Now that's 60, 65 percent of the participation. But it's, uh, this is just, these are just female numbers. Yes? In, in hearing this more and more about the women, do you think it's because men were initially the only ones that went to school and stuff, so it was their thirst for knowledge? When these got started, they jumped at the chance? Oh, I, the, no, because I mean, men didn't go to school either. Uh, frankly, if you looked at the graduates from high schools, anyhow, they were probably mostly women. More than 50% were probably the graduate from high schools in this country in 1870 were probably women. And they wound up as the school marm at the local one house. That's where they, that's where they came from. Right? Um, I think the bigger issue with men is they had jobs. The women who participated in here were um, housewives, teachers. Um, those were the two biggest groups. And that there's, unfortunately, there's a big group that is other. I don't know what the heck they are. But they do have some lists by occupation that give you about 15 or 20 options. And the two biggest would be housewives and teachers. And the other. <laughs> Which isn't like, in some places, it's only 5% is other. This is like 20% are other. 30% are other. So that doesn't help you very much. Um, Vincent didn't, that didn't, isn't something Vincent expected. He thought this was going to be something that was going to be perfect for men who were unable to have gone to college and this was going to give them a chance to get into a structured reading program. They didn't necessarily have the kind of formal education they would have liked to advance. This also is something that has been going, had been going on in Western society for several generations. Uh, the idea of, of uh, working men's associations providing education for workers. And Vincent really thought that's where this was going to take off. Nonetheless, he was absolutely an advocate of women going to this thing, um, what he would, this is the family thing. What he, what he wants is, uh, yeah, he expects men to go off, out to work and do this to advance their, their livelihood, to become better citizens, better parents. But he expects women to do this in part because, so that they can raise their children better. Uh, and they did, they jumped onto this thing. 
Yeah, and teach Sunday school, I'm sure. Um, the other thing to note here is the teachers. We're going to talk about this later on, but teachers are uh, ubiquitous in the Chautauqua movement because th the best a teacher was going to do is to graduate from high school. And what's their education look like after that? They didn't go to Eastern Michigan. Now, Eastern Michigan existed, but the chances of going to Eastern Michigan for any given individual is like this big. Right? So this is where teachers got advanced education and it ties into the Sunday school uh, pedagogy classes. The Sunday school pedagogy classes in, in 1879 were this big and the public school or the, 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 the public school kind of pedagogy classes at Chautauqua in 1879 were this big. Within a couple years, it's the reverse. The Sunday school normal classes, which is what you would call teacher training classes, normal school, normal classes, were this big and the other public school, that's the wrong phrase, but the, the, the you know, regular teacher normal classes were this big. Um, you check and see who goes to these, these, takes these classes at Chautauqua and there's going to be a heavy, heavy percentage of them will be teachers and women. Um, and then the other thing that happens with the CLSC is this thing. Uh, oh God. Um, th th this becomes, this requires, th there needs to be a lot more work on the relationship between the CLSC and women's clubs. It's there to be sure. Um, uh, what's interesting is the, uh, the first, one of the first times I ran into the, the actual documentation of a, a CLSC. It actually wasn't a CLSC. It was the Bayview Reading Club mm. that happened to be from Fenton, where I went to high school. So, okay, so I dive into this thing. When I moved to Fenton in like 1960, the thing still existed. Now, it had morphed into a women's club. Many of these women's clubs, in fact, probably most of the early women's clubs started as reading clubs. They may or may not have been associated with CLSC, but they started as reading clubs and then morphed into uh, women's clubs later. And then as women cl women's clubs, as members of the CLSC, these people become very active in community issues and are at the center of many of the reforms of the progressive era. Not political reforms, <coughs> but thing social reforms, the vote to be sure, union rights, uh, child labor, uh, health issues that are all associated with the progressive era. It's women that are leading the charge and the, the women's clubs and the CLSC, uh, women who have, have gone through the CLSC, play important parts in all of this. Now, at the same time, or what happens at the same time is Vincent and Miller start what became known, although it wasn't called this in the first year, Chautauqua University. They started a language school the first year. Uh, they started a normal education the first year. Okay? Um, and then some of these things uh, got started. Then they created more correspondence courses. Because the CLSC was so successful, they took this correspondence course business to the next level and started, uh, they in fact offered a seminary at Chautauqua for, you know, ministers and uh, at least part of it was as a correspondence course. It didn't work very well, but um, lots of children's programming, health and fitness kind of stuff, uh, homemaking, home economics, all of this stuff uh, is going on here at Chautauqua. It begins with what became the Chautauqua University along with the CLSC. Um, and the, the, the Chautauqua University eventually, in the mid-1880s, was, was uh, chartered by the state of New York to issue degrees, bachelor's degrees. They never did. Vincent wouldn't do it. Vincent and Miller thought it would be a bad idea. They were criticized enough, increasingly, for the fact that their programs were too superficial. Um, eventually, that became a, a cry against the CLSC and Chautauqua education in general. Um, which I think is pretty bogus. I mean, if any of you ever sat in a uh, Western Civ class your freshman year in college, pretty superficial, that! You know, your first two years was all superficial stuff. You really, it's not until you're into grad school you start getting real stuff. 
It's all pretty superficial. That's CLSC stands for. Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle. Um, so this is now moving to Chautauqua becoming a real educational institution. The CLSC is here, and then this stuff is up here. Um, and then what happens is you have this, this evolution towards the consideration of public issues. Uh, again, we talked about the Industrial Revolution changing things dramatically. Um, the, the Chautauquans don't, the, the whole idea of post-millennialism that I talked about as a driver for these reforms prior to the Civil War, you don't read about that in the post-Civil War era. Uh, you'll see ministers talk about it every once in a while, but it, it's not terminology that just shows up anymore. But you're a Christian, and you have an obligation to help your fellow man. Um, you have this, this post-millennial heritage that goes back prior to the Civil War, those great reforms prior to the Civil War. All that, that that's a tradition with this group of people. And then you have education. And you saw some of the classes here, that are the, the, the articles that I read. They are absolutely current event kinds of issues. Child labor, uh, Karl Marx. I mean, all of this stuff leads to the discussion of current events. And what happens is that Chautauqua winds up becoming a platform for the discussion of these issues. It would be wrong to say Chautauqua stood for anything in particular, other than the temperance movement, perhaps. Uh, but it, it absolutely stood for let's get up and talk about the issues. Okay. So you can find both sides of most issues on Chautauqua platforms. It's, they're, they're, it's not like Vincent and Miller are sitting there saying we want to take this side or this side. They didn't do that. But we are going to talk about the issues. What you do have is the evolution, and it's not exclusively at Chautauqua, but certainly Chautauqua is a platform for this, is the idea of the social gospel. This replaces this post-millennialism as a driver to reform. Um, oops. And essentially, well, one of the key guys is Washington Gladden. Um, every time you, you see these kind of slideshows, you see the picture of the old guy. Well, I ran across the picture of the young Washington Gladden, so I thought I'd give you a young Washington. All these old guys, they were young at one point. Even guys like me, we were young at one point, right? Yeah, smart-ass young punk up here in the front of the room. Uh, <laughs> well, they haven't called me that in, you know, millennium. Um, in any event, this, this is a Washington Gladden quote. Christians, Christians must recognize the devastating impact of more complex social sins. The nation's social ills, indigence, intemperance, disease, crime, prostitution, unemployment, dangerous working and housing conditions, and racial and sexual discrimination we're all interrelated. Therefore, Christians must labor to reconstruct the entire social order, not simply to reduce particular social maladies. It's not good enough to throw money in the poor box. You've got to go do something that's going to reform society. And this winds up being the essential philosophical underpinning of the progressive movement. It is evangelical Protestants like Washington Gladden and Gladden and others of the social gospel persuasion were on the platform at Chautauqua. They were ubiquitous. Um, the kinds of issues we're talking about are here. Okay. Uh, there are others, but these are clearly some of the big ones. The universal one that shows up almost every Chautauqua, almost every year, is something about temperance and prohibition. They won, right? Almost. Sort of, <laughs> for a while. 24 or is this 1870? Well, this is a Jacob Reese All photo. <laughs> All these issues, they begin um, 1890s and then up to uh, roughly 1920. But all of these issues are, are kind of late 19th century issues, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson in Detroit, the first progressive mayor in the country is Hazen Pingree from Detroit. Now, he didn't deal with... Didn't Ford he, and his wife go to Chautauqua? Yeah, I've heard the story. I've never seen it confirmed somewhere that they actually met at a CLSC meeting. Well, 
Whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But, the, but, but Clara, I think, was probably the CLSC hook, and Henry was there to see Clara. That would be my bat. I don't know. Uh, well, you talked about um, the leisure and providing it for yeah. created Camp Dearborn. Yeah. yeah. And that was kind of his the project, right? Um, yeah, it really wasn't a chateau. It's a camp, okay? I mean, it, it's, it ties into the... One of these days, I'm going to be back here, and I'll give you a, a, give you a lecture on this summer camp movement and muscular Christianity. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, and then here's... Some, I put these names up here because you may recognize many or most of them. Um, these, these folks were regular uh, uh, attendees on the Chautauqua platform. Um, Jane Adams was actually on the board of directors. Uh, Richard Ely, who is the most prominent economic, uh, economist in the progressive movement, um, he actually was the head of the education program at Bayview for a year. Um, again, these guys just show up time after time, and many, many others. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that these guys went to um, a Chautauqua and all they did was spend their time worrying about social issues. They didn't. They went boating. They went picnicking. They'd go to listen to entertainments and that sort of thing. But th there's certainly a piece of this that's there almost everywhere you look in the Chautauqua movement. Um, this is a book written by Charles Sheldon. He wound up spending his summers at the Congregational Summer Assembly up at uh, Frankfurt. It still exists. Uh, they operated like a Chautauqua when they first formed around 1908, but they never called themselves a Chautauqua. When I've gone up and talked to them, their historian, oh yeah, we were sort of a Chautauqua, but they never really thought of themselves as, as a Chautauqua. But the fact is they were. Sheldon, who writes this book, in his steps, what would Jesus do, is the epitome of the social gospel movement. Okay? Uh, it is, according to some historians, one of the top ten most influential American nonfiction books ever written. All right. Then we get to the end. So that's basically we're talking about the Mother Chautauqua. That's what we've been doing. I want to shift gears now and get to the independence. We've talked about the Mother Chautauquas and the Chautauqua at home, the CLSC. So we want to talk about the independents. Um, basically, what they were trying to do is to emulate what was going on at, uh, at Lake Chautauqua. Initially, what they did, what happened in the, with the first Chautauquas, is they were invariably camp meetings like Fairpoint. Fairpoint was a camp meeting site. Now, all the Chautauqua people did is they rented the facility to do their Sunday school training thing for the first few years, and then they bought the thing outright. But at Bayview, at Lakeside, those were camp meeting sites that were created in around 1874. There were, I think, about 150 camp meeting sites that were created in this post-Civil War era, say, up to about 1890. Um, a lot of them are still around. Anybody ever been to... Uh, Camp Simpson, uh, Romeo. Mm -hmm. That that is one of these camp meetings. Yeah, that that got started. It's still there. Um, it's no longer formally associated with the Methodist Church, but it's still there. They apparently, and I had some conversation with their historian, that they apparently considered the idea of going down the Chautauqua path in the 1890s. They didn't, but uh, they considered it. The point is this, that the early Chautauquas were camp meetings um, that looked at what Chautauqua was doing with the Sunday school training and they decided to get on board. And so by 1876, maybe even 75, the Round Lake camp meeting may have gotten on board in 1875, Lakeside and Bayview both got on board and started Sunday school uh, training f locations. And all of these were started with help from Vincent. Uh, John Vincent or his brother or other members of the Chautauqua 
family went out and helped these Chautauquas get these Sunday school camp meetings started. His brother, actually, Vincent's brother, wound up being the head of education at Lakeside for, I don't know, 25 years? Um, John Vincent himself goes on the road quite a bit to help these people get started. It wasn't a franchise, though, right? Okay? It's kind of the family business. I, I know. It's amazing. We, it, but it's one of the reasons why you have a heck of a time trying to define what a Chautauqua is. Because there were no rules. Right? Um, any of it. Um, Initially, that's the path. They become Sunday school training sessions, and then in 1878, you have the CLSC, which is now an education program that you can take on the road, right? And these these uh, Sunday school, or sorry, these uh, camp meetings that were doing the Sunday school stuff, decided to started to hold CLSC meetings at their camp meeting sites. And one of the things that happens is that the CLSCs would regularly bring in speakers. And so you had these round tables. And what that leads to then is the assembly. You have these auditoriums that you'd have at a camp meeting site for the, the, the preachers to get up and do their thing. Well, let's bring in some entertainment. Let's bring in some lecturers. And you start having, without too much effort, these camp meeting sites can start to become like Chautauqua. They're C they have the, the Sunday school training stuff, they have the CLSC thing going on with round tables, and then they start bringing entertainment and lecturers in to use the auditorium. And they gradually evolve. I mean, it takes Bayview until the mid-1880s to really get fully on board. Lakeside gets there a little bit earlier in the early 1880s, and some of them get there you know, pretty quickly. Uh, but it, it's an evolution. Um, you have, in my view, and I need to do more work on this, to be honest with you, but I think there's three types of Chautauquas, three types of independent Chautauquas. You have this camp meeting Chautauqua, like Bayview. They start off as a camp meeting, then they go to the Sunday school training stuff, then they start to have assemblies, and then some of them, like Bayview, start to have full education programs. Um, then you have what I would call the resort Chautauquas. They start on day one, they're a full-blown Chautauqua. It's not evolutionary at all. That's what happened at Lake Orion. Um, it's, it's basically a place where you can kind of build a resort and have it as a Chautauqua. And they start off with education and the CLSC and all of this stuff on day one. Uh, there's, as near as I can tell, I would say there's probably between 100 and 200 of those. Um, and then you get what I would call, oops, the booster Chautauquas. These are, well, and these, these resort Chautauquas, like the Camp Meeting Chautauquas, uh, seem to go into this as if they were going to be long-lived institutions. They built permanent structures, they raised money, they intended to be around for a long time. Then you get to the booster Chautauquas. And this is something that I started to run into in the post-1900 era, where you'd get a town, you have all these Chautauquas that are around the country, and then Owasso decides they're going to have a Chautauqua. It lasts one year. They put up a tent, they have a Chautauqua, and that's it. Uh, Lansing, uh, Jackson, Battle Creek, who was the fourth, Kalamazoo, between 1907, 8, and 9, they all had Chautauquas. Okay? They were one-week Chautauquas in a tent, in a park, in the city. And each time they did it, there was a, potentially a different organization that was responsible. Like it would be the Kiwanis one year and they'd organize it. And then the next year it was the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Christian League. Or then the next year it would be the Epworth League. And then it would be the Women's Club. or whatever, and they would organize the Chautauqua, and at the end of the Chautauqua, they'd decide whether, they'd see if they could get somebody else to pick it up and sponsor it for the next year. It was a thing like, well, you know, Jackson's doing it, so we should do it. And it was kind of a booster thing. And they were short. There was nothing really long-lived about them. I think that's several hundred Chautauquas. So when somebody says there were 500 Chautauquas, I'd say two or three hundred of them were this. 
All of these Chautauquas had this in common. There is invariably the religious link. Initially, of course, is this evangelical Protestants, but Jewish and Catholic also got in the, in the game. Um, there is the CLSC bit. Uh, then you have the recreation bit, and then you have the assembly piece. The assembly piece is, again, you've got this auditorium, you've got a stage, you bring in lecturers, you bring in humorists, you bring in entertainment. They could last for a week, they could last for nine weeks. But if they're going to last nine weeks, you started to bring in this other stuff too. And again, there's no rules. Okay, there's no rules. Just a question on that, especially these uh, resort Chautauquas. Was there a, like a singular owner for those ones, especially when you have like a resort property and buildings and that much organization? Um, uh, yeah, they, they would have, a, in, in Lake Orion, there was the Lake Orion Assembly Resort that initially owned the whole kit and caboodle. Um, at Epworth Heights, outside of uh, Ludington, same thing. There was the Epworth Heights Assembly. They owned everything. It still exists. It's a gated community. You can't get in, um, but it doesn't do any Chautauqua stuff anymore. Okay, they, stopped, they voted themselves out of the Chautauqua business in 1924. Was it like a small business then, or was it maybe more like a religious? It, well, there's clearly this religious connection most of the time. Uh, as time goes on, the resort Chautauquas, the booster Chautauquas lose some of that religious orientation. Okay. Not so much the independents, but certainly the boosters. You don't see much of the, the religious stuff at the boosters. It's there. I mean, it's 1908 America. You don't go very far without being a good old stock Protestant. Uh, so they were there, but they weren't as formalized as you'd have in the independents. Okay. The, the only reason I ask is it seems like there would be a lot of financial... You know, things are involved at that point. I know you said earlier. Well, that's why these things went out of business. Uh huh. Okay. That's why they went out of business. That's exactly what happened to Lake Orion. Um, so Bayview is the, 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 the first and biggest of the Chautauquas in Michigan. Um, and we're going to run out of time here, so I'm going to blow through this. But uh, it was, in some years, in many ways, it was comparable. They like to think themselves as being comparable to Chautauqua. I don't think they ever really were, but they had a few good years, primarily under the leadership of a guy by the name of John Hall, who started off in all of this being a big advocate of the CLSC, and then in the mid-1880s, he decided to start his own organization. And the Bayview Reading Club uh, became parallel to the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle. The difference being, really, that the CLSC was a little more complex the Bayview was simpler, okay? It wasn't as complex as uh, the CLSC. And actually, John Hall ran that thing until he died in 1914. Now, he stepped away from Bayview. They had a great 1880s, mid-1880s up to the to 1900. They were doing great balls of fire under John Hall's leadership. Then he retired, basically stepped away from it, and Bayview went into the tank for a few years. Hall went and just was doing his Bayview Reading Club stuff. And then about 1905, he came back, 1906, he came back, and then Bayview got back on its horse and started to, to do uh, more things. Um, that's John Hall. Uh, they had, uh, it, it, they had a, a very substantial educational program. Here's 90 courses, 790 students, 45 instructors. In 1917, Albion College picked it up. And they ran a summer school up there until the 1960s. And then they shut it down because Albion wanted to have their own summer school back in Albion, and so they didn't want to have competition. Um, now, it's, the biggest part of Bayview is the music festival. They do have the educational stuff. It, it's still, a, you can certainly make a case it's still a fully functioning Chautauqua, but the biggest piece of it is the, is the music festival. Lake Orion comes into being around 1897, um, when the Detroit Methodists kind of acquired Park Island to establish a Chautauqua. I think they had some kind of an event in 1897, but as a Chautauqua, it doesn't begin until 1898. At least that's when they first start calling it. The reason why uh, Lake Orion is like what happens with many of these independents, they're on a railroad. You could get uh, uh, participants out from a big city, Detroit, 
on the railroad. Okay? And then within a couple of years, the inner urban gets laid out here. Uh, that is just dirt common with these independent Chautauquas. Um, Bayview had a real, the, the property from Bayview was basically gifted to them by the railroad. Uh, Ludington, the, the Epworth Heights Assembly, same thing. Property gr uh, granted from the railroad. Guaranteed passengers. Guaranteed passengers. That's what they were looking for, ridership. Especially like Bayview and Ludington and that sort of thing. The, the, the industry was the uh, lumber industry. <laughs> well, that's in the tank. What are we going to do? Well, this is when the West Coast starts to become a resort area. People coming up, especially from Chicago. Um, let's see, what was I going to say here? Um, and just to give you an idea of the, the big eyes that Lake Orion had, they are one of the founding members of the International Chautauqua Alliance, which was really the, the big players in the Chautauqua independence and the mother Chautauqua got together. I think they started in 1899, and they were trying to organize the Chautauquas. They were starting to, they were starting to have financial problems, is what was going on. And they were trying to essentially figure out a way to to survive financially and keep the quality high because you had so many of these independents that were out there that were kind of going down the wrong path in terms of having quality pr kind of programming. And so the, the alliance was an attempt to kind of get that under control. The other thing that we need to mention here is the Lake Orion Power and Light Company. Apparently, Paint Creek comes out of Lake Orion, right? And there was a water mill there that burned in like 1890 or whatever, 99 or something. And a company by the name of the Lake Orion Power and Light Company, under the leadership of John Winter and Dr. Lau or something, they create this. Winter, at least, was the treasurer of the, of the Chautauqua that got started here. Um, in any event, the 1901 program looks like this. They have 40 lectures. And, some, and, and entertainments. They have a CLSC recognition day, which means they have a CLSC round table and CLSC meetings going on. They have a summer school with eight departments. Uh, they have a normal program for teachers and then they have special events. All of this stuff is just dirt common in an independent Chautauqua. That's, now this one went on for three weeks. Not all of them went on that long. Most of them didn't. Most of the independents, they were one and two week, yeah, 10 day, two week, kinds of things. So this is relatively long, not the longest. Uh, Bayview is, goes all summer, Lakeside goes all summer, Mont Eagle goes all summer. Uh, so there's a lot of them that went all summer, but three weeks is relatively long for an independent. And then they have on their platform, uh, you know, this guy, Golden Rule Jones, he is, was a, a progressive mayor of Toledo. So he comes up to Chautauqua and talks about basically the reforms in Toledo. He does that in like I think 1900. Uh, you have, uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Uh, gosh. Oh, uh, I don't have them written down here, but um, the, who was the rabbi at uh, Temple Beth El? Leo Franklin. Leo Franklin came up here and was, had, gave a lecture on, you know, Christians and Jews kind of working together type of thing. Uh, Leo Franklin was on the circuit a little bit. Um, and then you had, again, the entertainment that, that oftentimes was going to be classical, but then gradually it starts to become a little bit less so. One of the things that, the two things that are ubiquitous in the Chautauquas were black groups usually coming from some all-black college in the south. They come up and tour the Chautauquas in the summer, raise money for their college. In this particular year, here in 1901, there was a South African group of boy singers, black South African boys, that were kind of on tour. But that was about as close as the Chautauquas got to segregation or to integration. That's one of the embarrassments, I think, of the progressive movement is it kind of stepped away from the black crisis in America. Excuse me. Yeah. If I understand you correctly, you, for Lake Orion, that was more of a resort group. So, I mean, I know that 
Bellevue Island was Assembly Island, and that they would meet there, but they didn't do the tents. Um, no, they had a permanent, this was a permanent structure. Well, it said two hotels. Two hotels, uh, they had a 2,000 seat uh, uh, auditorium. Oh, okay. uh, there were many cottages built, uh, although initially they, they oftentimes wound up in tents for the first few years. But that was well, Park Island. That was Park Island. Uh, the, the, there were many of these islands that were part of, this, the, of, the, okay. of, the, uh, of this, the assembly initially. Okay. But the Bellevue Hotel that was one of them. was one of them. Yeah, that was refurbished in 1898 or whatever to get ready for the 1898 season. John Winter bought it. John Winter. We're going to get to John Winter here in just a minute. I don't know enough about John Winter, but here's what happened here. Basically, by the time you get to 1906, the assembly is starting to fall on hard times. They sell off the property to the Lake Orion Power and Light Company, which is John Winter and Dr. Lau here. I don't know anything about Dr. Lau. It sounds like a 1930s mystery guy, but um, in any event, um, by 19, 1909, the Power and Light Company is in receivership. And they sell off the property to the Lake Orion Summer Home Company, which is John Winter. Um, and the next year, John Winter and I think Dr. Lau open up the Park Island Amusement Park. And then, in 1914, the traveling Chautauqua shows up in the form of the Midland um, Circuit Chautauqua. And for at least the next three years, 14, 15, and 16, there's a traveling Chautauqua that comes to uh, Lake Orion. I think at some point in the past, I've found a Chautauqua here in the 1920s as well. I don't know how many seasons. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky to find this stuff. Uh, nowadays, I'm resor I have to resort to going to the newspapers to find it. Um, uh, because the, uh, the, the archives that has most of the stuff, they just don't have it all. Uh, it's at the University of Iowa. I've spent several days banging around there, and I just can't find it. Any event, um, we don't have time to talk about Lakeside or Epworth Heights, but these are, I, I bring up Lakeside because it's so darn close, and it is a fully functioning Chautauqua. You want to have a good few days, go to the Lakeside Chautauqua, okay? Uh, that's going to take you back 100 years. Um, um, and then we get to the Circuit Chautauquas. Basically what happened here is that all of these independents are trying to get talent in the form of lecturers and entertainment to come in. And what they start doing is relying on lyceum bureaus. There's a whole history behind the lyceums, but that goes back to adult education in the 1820s. And by the time we get to our era, there are bureaus that are booking talent around the country for lyceums. But they also get drawn into booking talent for these Chautauquas, particularly the independent Chautauquas. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that booking this talent was a real pain in the neck. And so they started the shortcut by going to the Lyceum Bureaus. And in 1904, Keith Vautar, who had recently acquired the franchise for the Red Path Lyceum in Iowa, there were three or four Red Path Lyceums around the country, he bought into one in Iowa and decided what he was going to do is to put together a traveling Chautauqua. He, he was booking independent Chautauquas and in the on the off weeks he tried to create a traveling Chautauqua that he could keep the talent together and have them show up work one week in a in an independent Chautauqua and then he'd have his own Chautauqua essentially in a nearby town so he could keep the talent busy all summer didn't work out very well 1908 though he came back with a new plan and it worked like this You'd show up in Rochester with, he'd take his talent and divide it into seven teams if he has a seven-day Chautauqua. And typically that's what they were. So day one, on Sunday, team one would show up in Rochester. And they'd do whatever team one does. And then they'd get on the train either Monday morning or Sunday night and go to Lapeer. And they'd do the same gig they did on Sunday in Lapeer. And then the next day they'd go to Bay City. Meanwhile, showing up in Rochester on Monday was team two. They do their thing and move on to Lapeer, and on it would go. So basically, one company could be in seven towns at one time. Okay, they'd break up their their their, their uh, 
circuit into these seven teams and they'd move them around the country. Uh, if you do the math on this, and when you find out that there were something like 90 circuits, maybe 20, 25 companies, many of them had three or four or five circuits. There was something like 90 circuits operating in the early 1920s. If you start in the south and finish in the south, you can get to, you know, 12, 15,000 towns being covered by these circuit Chautauquas. When somebody tells me that you could get 40 million people in, I don't know, what, what was the number, 20,000 towns, I go back and do the math, it doesn't work. But 12,000? You can get to 12,000 towns pretty easily with Vautar's method. The other thing Vautar did is he came up with a contract. You'd show up in town, you'd get your agent to go to town, and they'd have a contract. And we, wouldn't you like to have a Chautauqua in your town? Wouldn't that be great to have a Chautauqua here in Lake Orion? And we'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sign here. And basically what you have to do is sell 300 tickets. And you get your, everybody in this room signs on the dotted line, and you guys have now charged with going out and selling the 300 oh, tickets. If you don't sell the 300 tickets, you're on the, on the, on the line for those that aren't sold. Okay? That's this contract for Birmingham in 1915. Most of the time, Chautauquas did okay, but here, Royal Oak in 19 whenever, uh, they missed by 500 bucks. So now, all of these guys who signed the contract in Royal Oak in that particular year, they have to pony up to cover the $500. And yet, they'd sign up again for the next Chautauqua. Community pride. Uh, this wasn't about making money. Towns never made any money in the Chautauquas. If they broke even, they were tickled pink. As long as you had a good show, um, people tended to be pretty happy. Here's the, the Chautauquas that I have found in this kind of area, traveling circuit Chautauquas. Most of them were on, uh, did this for multiple years, but uh, not necessarily the 15, 20 years that circuits ran. Uh, but they'd, they'd have them for many years in a row, usually. Um, so these are kind of the numbers. I have found at least 150 in Michigan that I can confirm that actually existed. Um, and here's my estimation of what the numbers were like in 1924. Um, and then here's, you know, some of the speakers, you know, well, let, let, me, let me just get to Holly here. The bell ringers, ubiquitous, they were everywhere. Um, a, a humorist that comes up. People, the Chautauquans loved travelogues. So here's a guy who's been exploring down in, in South America. The Unseen Empire, this is 1915. The Unseen Empire is a peace play. 1915. What do you think that's about? Right? World War I. Uh, John Boardman was a, an urban planner. Henry Asher was one of the first senators from Arizona. It turns out he was pretty much of a slug, uh, but this, he's new. He's the first senator from Arizona, so he gets on the, on the circuit. And then, you know, the quintet here, uh, the Bohemian girls singing or playing a performance, a play. In the end, I mean, these things were obviously very, very successful, but in the end, it all goes away. It pretty much starts to go downhill, in my view, about 1918, 1919. Um, and here's kind of some of the reasons, what I see are some of the chief reasons. Post-war America, the progressive era, is over. Uh, this is back to normalcy. This is Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge, and we just want to go out and have a good time. Okay? And Chautauqua has started to, uh, the progressive movement started to go away, which meant that a lot of the thunder behind the Chautauqua was disappeared. The educational opportunities, you saw those, those statistics earlier on, the number of people that went to high schools in 1930 versus 19, or 1870, it's night and day, right? Well, you don't, the Chautauqua isn't filling the same kind of educational role that it had been initially. You have movies are coming in, which were big at Chautauquas, by the way. Beginning about 1900, Chautauquas almost always had some form of movies, the Edison, video, or Edison Videograph was here at Lake Orion in 1900. Um, uh, the, the big, one of the big things, of course, is the automobile. Uh, you know, in 1900, you got to that Chautauqua either on the train or the interurban, or you took your horse and buggy and went to town. 
and camped out at the Chautauqua for whatever period of time. Um, you, you didn't have much of a chance to see, to get educational kinds of things, le lectures, that sort of thing, entertainments. You lived on a farm. You can't take old Dobbin to town six or seven miles and back every night. Maybe you go into town once a week or every other week. With a car, <laughs> scoot into town, go to the movies, come home any night you want. You didn't need the Chautauqua, this special event that shows up once a year, to get your fill. You could go to the automobile. And then you asked about money. Yeah, they overbuilt. They, they, there was uh, competition. They couldn't keep up the, the attendance. And these things started to go south. And that's exactly what happened in Lake Orion. Uh, the, the circuits were competing with the independents, the independents are competing with one another, and then everybody is competing with this stuff. And then along comes the Depression. That's it. Whatever was left in 1930 is gone because of the Depression. Today, as I mentioned, there are a handful of Chautauquas that still function. This is the Chautauqua Trail. Uh, this is a couple year old map. It's not all of these are still there, but the, the real ones are all here. You get some that kind of come and go, as I mentioned earlier. But the ones that are closest to us would be Lakeside, that's the closest, Bayview, and then Chautauqua, New York isn't that far away. Um, if you ever get the chance, go to Chautauqua for three or four or five days. They are, it's like going back a hundred years. They're absolutely wonderful, if you get to a good one. Uh, the closest would be Lakeside, and that's really pretty good. And then Chautauqua, New York is outstanding. Bayview is good, but it's not like the other two. And there you go. So, questions? Yeah. What brought you interested in Interesting question. Um, I travel. I travel a lot. I started traveling when I was 18, and I haven't stopped. When I was a kid, I hitchhiked. I was hitchhiking out east. I got picked up by this woman in, uh, we were in uh, western PA, Pennsylvania, near Erie, Pennsylvania, out on some country road. She had gone out to get corn and tomatoes or whatever the hell you get at farmer's food stands. And so she picks me up. I'm there hitchhiking and she's got two kids in the back seat. And she starts driving and she asks, you know, what I'm doing. And I tell her I'm working on, you know, going to be a history teacher. And, um, she says, well, do you know what a Chautauqua is? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. She said, well, you're coming with me. <laughs> Turns out her family had owned a cottage at Chautauqua in New York for three generations. Uh, it was a rundown old place, not much bigger than this room. They had a front porch. Go sleep on the porch. She fed me dinner. I went down to the auditorium and saw Al Hurt perform that night. <laughs> The next morning, I got up and walked down to the auditorium, and there was a lecturer there from, he was assist, under Secretary of State for African Affairs. And he had like an hour and a half talk on whatever was going on in Africa in 1960, whatever this was. And then I went down to the, uh, the very well-known map of Palestine, which is a, a it's, it's kind of built into the side of the lake, and they've got rocks standing for different towns and that sort of thing. It's you know, twice the size, three times the size of this room. And it's, it's a kind of a topographic map of the Holy Lands. And I walked around there for a half an hour. Still there, I was back in, at Lakes, I've been back to Lakes, or I should talk a couple times in the last three or four years. And I always go down to the Palestine map, um, just because it's kind of interesting. Um, and then I continue my journey. And then when I started teaching history, um, whenever, I would usually some, find some way to draw Chautauqua in and then around 19, 2000, I was brought in to do some writing for the Gale Group. You can find an article I wrote in one of the Gale, magazine, Gale books on Chautauqua. And uh, since then, I've really dived into the Chautauqua thing uh, quite a bit. And uh, in fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going down to Lakeside to give more or less this lecture to the Lakeside or to the Chautauqua Trail all of those members of this national organization. Um, so I'm going down there to talk to them. Full circle. Yeah. So was the Lake Orion Chautauqua then was not just one confined area? It was spread out all around the lake? 
Yeah, um, I don't know exactly how much, but in, in the reading that I've done, and this is, the, 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 I have not found anything like an archives of the Lake Orient Chautauqua. So this is mostly newspaper stuff, which is notoriously incomplete. But the original organization uh, acquired, uh, you know, a bunch of the islands and some of the lakefront. Now, ultimately, this gets sold to Winter. Uh, and he, he's the guy who walks away with the property. Uh, I think when Winter acquired this stuff in 1906 with the, with the Lake Orion Light and Power Company, that the Chautauqua Lake Orion Resort Assembly Organization continued to do the programming. They just didn't own the property anymore. It looks to me as I read this, and you're really kind of reading between the lines, like this, this, this organization that had started in 1897 continued to run the programming even though they didn't own the property and were about to get thrown out. Oh, yeah. Did you see during the meal that they stayed here with their families meal and waited closing it down for the winter and everybody to leave? N no, not directly. Um, what happened at a lot of these Chautauquas today if you're familiar with Lakeside or with Bayview, you know, it's, it's like laid out like a, like a subdivision. A lot of these Chautauquas became subdivisions in neighboring towns. When they started to close down in 1910, 1920, 1930, they got absorbed into the local town. Some of them became in, stayed operational as enclosed resort communities like Epworth out near Ludington. Um, but some of them just got absorbed into the local town. There's one down outside of Lebanon, Ohio that is just part of the community. It's not much of a community, but it's... But Bayview is still private. Bayview's private. Yes. Yes. It didn't, it, it hasn't been absorbed by Petoskey. Right. But there are others that have. Yes. What about Old Orchard Beach in Maine? Old Orchard Beach is not a Chautauqua. Okay. No. Was it ever? No. no. There is um, Ocean, I get these wrong, Ocean Grove and Ocean Park are two Current camp meetings, the one in Maine still has a little bit of a Chautauqua function to it. The one in New Jersey is, I think, mostly just a camp meeting. Um, but they were Chautauquas, and the Ocean Grove or Ocean Park, whichever the ones in Maine, is close to Old Orchard Beach, okay. but it's not part of it. Okay, my work is done. Thank Thanks you. for your interest. <laughs>